Good afternoon. This is Dr. George Waldreich. I am the president and CEO of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. In addition, I am on the faculties of the University of Pennsylvania and Temple University Schools of Medicine. We are very fortunate to have a group of five distinguished physicians who are also fellows of the College of Physicians to talk about their personal experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still, as you all know, going on, though less virulently than recently. I'm going to go around first and ask them to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about who they are and what they've been doing explicitly for the first last two months. I'll start with Dr. Valerie Arkush. Dr. Arkush. Thank you, George. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Val Arkush. I currently serve in an elected position as chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. Uh, Montgomery County, as I'm sure you know, is a county just to the west of Philadelphia. Uh, 830,000 residents. I oversee about a $420 million budget. Uh, I, prior to this, up until about five years ago, I was a practicing obstetric anesthesiologist. Most recently at HUP, I was professor of clinical anesthesiology and clinical obstetrics and gynecology, but uh, no longer have the, the time or the bandwidth to be able to practice clinically. I also have a master's in public health from uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and that has certainly been of enormous use to me in the last uh, 11 weeks. Thank you. Dr. Priya Mammon. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, as Dr. Rolwick said, my name is Priya Mammon. Um, I'm an emergency physician as well as a public health consultant. Um, for the last two months, I actually uh, wear several hats. So I am a clinical emergency physician and have um, most certainly been on the front lines from acute care in, ter in terms of COVID and everything else that our population deals with. Um, I'm also um, an addiction medicine provider, um, and I work at Kensington Hospital, um, providing um, medical directorship of the outpatient clinic. And finally, I am um, adjunct faculty at University of Pennsylvania. I taught an undergraduate course um, in the health and societies major. Um, on foundations of public health. And so, and I'm also a trustee of the College of Physicians as well as the chair of the section of public health and preventive medicine. So among all those hats, and I'm also on a couple advisory boards for the city, all those hats in the last two months have come to um, a tipping point in many ways. Um, emergency care for obvious reasons, addiction care for other reasons, um, of the barriers and nuances that we have to consider with um, shutdown and with access for patients to get to treatment um, and working within a system that is highly, highly regulated um, in very different ways than the physical health side. Um, and then in terms of students and um, kind of helping them navigate not only um, content and coursework, um, but just their wellness and kind of holding their hands a little bit as we are all dealing with the unknowns and them often starting a new phase of their life now in a different context. So it's been busy to say the least. Thank you. Next is Dr. Thomas Feketa. Dr. Feketa. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Tom Feketa. I'm the chair of medicine at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. I'm also Chief of Service of the Medicine Service at Temple University Hospital. And I'm also a practicing infectious diseases doctor, which turns out to be handier than I thought it would be at this point in my life. Temple has uh, really been bearing a lot of the brunt of the uh, COVID epidemic in Philadelphia uh, for a number of reasons. And I think we've explored a lot of what's happening in our society by virtue of who's coming into our hospital and the needs that they have for us. Uh, certainly, we have had to make a lot of modifications in the practice of medicine in the hospital, both in terms of providing more services around uh, the COVID patients and the needs they have, and then flexing our outpatient ambulatory services to a more uh, telemedicine model, which has all been very challenging. I would also say that there have been an extraordinary number of meetings where we've had to meet unbelievably uh, unique challenges in terms of, do we have enough gowns and masks and gloves? Do we have enough 
testing kits for this virus? Do we have the right people who can go over there and provide the services that no one knows how to provide because they're of course all brand new? It's been unbelievably exciting, unbelievably challenging, a little bit scary, a little bit depressing. And at the same time, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I think this is one of those things you expect might happen to you in your lifetime and kind of hope it doesn't and kind of hope it does. And I feel like I'm very fortunate at this later stage in my career to have the experience and maturity to be there and hopefully to have the, uh, the trust of my colleagues and my patients as well. So it's been an exciting and scary and, and, and very weird time for me. By the way, I will take moderator's privilege and indicate that Dr. Feckett is also chair of the board of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. True. Dr. Erin Naruski, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Naruski. Um, I'm a pulmonologist and a critical care physician. I'm a medical educator. I'm an assistant professor of those things. Um, my last couple of months have been about double my normal uh, level of output in intensive care services and advanced pulmonary services. And so I've been taking care of some of the sicker patients that have been admitted at our hospital, which is um, Temple University Hospital at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine. Uh, I am the beneficiary of Dr. Feketa's hard work. And um, in the last few months in the ICU and on advanced pulmonary services, we've really seen it all when it comes to COVID. Um, and I can certainly comment about patient experience in this situation and uh, you know, provider experience in this situation, which has been so trying for all of us and so rewarding in other ways. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to take your questions. Thank you. And last, certainly far from least, Dr. Jack Endy. Aaron, we're all the beneficiaries of Dr. Feketa's work. That includes myself. I am Jack Endy. I'm the Schaefer Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a general internist. I've been privileged to serve as president of the Association of Program Directors in Internal Medicine. More recently, president of the American College of Physicians and a long time member of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I'm a practicing general internist, a bit of a dinosaur. I see both outpatients and patient attending both. Um, what I've, I've been doing for the last two months, I've done more video conferences and telephone calls and, and talking to patients directly as I try to establish a degree of equilibrium among my patient population to allow them to negotiate these very, very hard times. I will soon be returning to the office I'm doing video uh, case video visits already, but we'll soon be doing face-to-face -face visits, and I look forward to describing for everybody what that's likely to entail. Thank you. In our questions this afternoon, we're going to range from the general to the very specific. Uh, any of our panelists is free to jump in, but we all realize that every single question here could lead to an hour long discussion of itself. So I may get a little directive at time. So let me start with a loaded question. Did any of you ever think you would experience something like this aside from the movies or textbooks on historical pandemics, epidemics? Dr. Arkush is shaking her head. So let me go to her first. No, <clears throat> I certainly never expected anything like this, um, particularly for the duration of this experience, and, and we are by no means out of it. Uh, in Montgomery County, we were one of the first counties to be identified as being home to cases of COVID-19. We got notice of our first two cases on Saturday, March the 7th. And that just began an endless series of decisions about how to communicate with the public, how to organize our work. Um, you know, it, every single thing that our county government does and our Office of Public Health has uh, done and continues to do has been altered by this. And um, the importance of, of trying to communicate a clear and consistent message to the public, you know, educate them, 
at the same time that you're trying to keep them engaged in what's happening has been an incredible undertaking. And Dr. Nareski, I saw you shaking your head there, so let me come to you. I'm an enormous fan of all movies about viruses. And so <laughs> I, I'm also, uh, you know, a younger clinician. So I kind of thought that at some point in my career, we might face something. But the thing that I didn't anticipate was the incredible stretch and effort that our health system has done to make this happen, to make ourselves able to care for the surge of patients with this brand new disease, try to figure it out, try to treat it in such um, a short time and to such great effect. You know, I, I think I, I probably before this event had a more cynical outlook that we would simply become overwhelmed and have to do triage. But instead, what's happened is that we've risen to the challenge and given awesome care to every patient. And that, that makes me really proud of us and what we do in a way that I would never have anticipated we could have done. Let, let me, Dr. Andy, please. Yes, thank you. Um, as perhaps the most senior person on the panel, I cut my teeth as an academic physician during the HIV epidemic in the late, very late 70s, early to mid 80s. But as uh, Tom Feckerton knows so well, it was different. Uh, yes, we had, we had hospital wards filled with HIV patients, but it was not that insidious, you can catch it from just breathing in the air, or just being close to people, that we now experience with COVID-19. It was disquieting, it was disruptive. It changed, uh, it brought to mind, you know, the plague as we all rallied to take care of HIV patients and take care of them as best we could. So that, that is my foundation for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so there were a lot of similarities and yet there are a lot of differences as well. One of the similarities, and I would ask Dr. Feckett and Dr. Mammon about this, is that when the HIV AIDS epidemic started, there were no specific therapeutics, much less vaccines. We have that same, unless one believes press briefings coming from Washington, we too now have no specific therapeutics and no active vaccines. What is that like for the two of you as practicing physicians? Dr. Matt, you go first. Okay, I'll go first. So there's, there's a few layers to that. Um, I think, you know, the medical decision making that happens in the emergency department um, is, can be seen as sort of very binary. So like sick, not sick. <laughs> And if it's sick, like ICU level, not ICU level. And if it's not sick, like discharge and, you know, what they need to know. Um, what happens here is everything is sort of turned on its head in that you can sort of say, okay, sick, not sick immediately. Um, you don't necessarily know if the not sick is, is like going to last. And the discharge instructions are you know, our, the meaning of them changes exquisitely based on who you're talking to. So if um, sick or not sick, able to go home and you have a ton of comorbidities and you live at home alone is like one thing. Not sick, live in a multi-generational home and, um, or, you know, like housing in which many people are under the same roof, it's impossible to say isolate, um, or you know that you're saying isolate, and the reality is that's not feasible. It's not going to happen. And so on the one hand, you can just see there the disparities that exist in just the ability to implement um, evidence, what we know of evidence-based practice. The sick, not sick, sick kind of on the borderline you know, it's, I mean, it's almost the easiest to be like, I can say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad Aaron is there because here's an ICU patient <laughs> and they're going to be able to take care of this because they're already very, very sick and maybe starting to kind of um, very swiftly go downhill. It's, it's all of the other people and it's what it means to them to be able to practically 
um, implement what we want them to. So there's the fact that there's no pill is not something that's new. Well, there's plenty of things that even though people think an antibiotic will fix everything, we know that that's not the case. But we can clearly tell them, here are the signs of concern and here are how you identify those and here's when you pull the trigger to come back. And in this case, it's not, you know, it's like if you get more short of breath, but we don't really have a way to tell you, okay, you know, check your pulse ox. If it's less than 80, then make sure to come in. <laughs> you know, it's um, these very um, nebulous things. And the, the nebulous also comes into just the contextual setting of the patient um, that changes everything. The flip is what is very new to me and perhaps harkens back to HIV in the early days is a lot of my decision making as an emergency physician is based on what I know about the diagnostics. So if I know that I can rely on a positive predictive value or I can rely on the sensitivity and specificity of tests that I am familiar with, then it helps me make decisions. And in this case, we never had that and we still don't. So I work at a small community hospital. We don't have uh, in the county, in the Collar County. So we don't have testing capabilities within the hospital. So it changes everything of like, everything is based on a clinical picture without a clear sense of what the next phases and steps are. Somebody could be totally fine and somebody of the same age, same um, comorbidity profile can all of a sudden turn. And I have not, from my vantage, been able to say, I think you're more likely to go down quickly. It just becomes anecdotally over time. And I think, um, I don't know if Dr. Nursky would agree with this, but I can say I certainly have learned just as much over Twitter than I've ever learned from a journal. <laughs> and this is the time where we're all just sharing what is basically anecdotal information that is all we have to work on. Um, and nobody has time to write up the studies yet because we're just in the midst of it. So the, the randomized control trials cannot happen, but we're learning from, you know, like I have emergency colleagues in Italy who have been texting or tweeting about things. And that's, we're basically just keeping up day to day on new information just from population. So all, I think from the original question, I think psychologically as an emergency physician, we're always kind of waiting for something bad to happen. <laughs> um, and the mass casualty kind of scenario and that kind of thing. Um, to be working, you know, in a level of arrogance, the ED, we have like every technology, every test potentially at our fingers and our job is to be judicious on how we use them. I've never been in a situation where we don't have those things at our fingers and we have to ask permission and, and or we have to really ration in a way that I've not, I'm not used to and not thought about and we don't have any clear way to have answers. Even I, if we did. I will come back to one of those things. Dr. Fekete, did you want to add something here? just wanted to mention, uh, going off of what Dr. Andy was saying, that I um, started my ID fellowship in 1981, which is the exact same time when uh, the AIDS crisis began. We didn't know what was the cause of it for several years. We knew it was something infectious. And in some ways, the similarities are astounding, but in some ways, they're different because there's a disease that moved relatively slowly, and this one kind of moves pretty fast. And we had no treatment for either one, which is similar. Uh, but now we have diagnostic tests, imperfect as they are. And in those days, the people who got HIV disease were large people who were, uh, let's say, marginalized by society. And now it's kind of everybody. So it's fascinating to look at the similarities, the differences, and try to picture how our 40 years or 39 years of advances in medicine have both helped and not yet helped in this kind of setting with low information and a lot of anxiety. And unlike HIV, all of society has changed, not just the people who are ill, but everybody, everyone's community life has been totally changed. Kids aren't going to school, people aren't going out, they're not socializing in the normal ways. And it's had a tremendous effect on people, especially people living in 
nursing homes and settings where they have already some limited social exposure. So I think it's been extraordinary and every day seems both the same and different. It's, it's fascinating and to me, this is one thing that makes me sometimes very sad that I don't have the bandwidth to absorb all the interesting stuff, but I'm picking up all kinds of sort of emotional vibrations, not my usual style, but I have to say it's, it's, it's hitting me that funny way. And I want to, I, Jack, sorry, Dr. Andrew, I want to ask Dr. Narosky a question about modalities of intervention and Twitter. To caricature, when this pandemic started, the only thing one heard about in the lay press is get, a, get ventilators. Then over time, it started to, one started to hear, well, maybe we don't need ventilators. And then it was, maybe ventilators aren't good for you. And how has that evolved from you as a pulmonologist and critical care doctor in a center that is renowned for pulmonology? Initially, in the beginning phases of this epidemic, we relied on our colleagues in China and then our colleagues in Italy to tell us about their experiences. And we have to be incredibly grateful for the ability that they showed to publish this, their experiences, even if it was preliminary, if, even if it was early information, quickly so that we could review it and, and integrate it. And that effort is still enormous and ongoing and something that I'm um, you know, proud to be a part of in our own ICU, uh, where almost all of our patients are enrolled in a clinical trial of some kind. Um, so in terms of ventilators, I think the initial concern that most of us in the critical care community had was the reach that this infection has the potential to create. And I say has because it still has. Um, and ventilators are a life-saving resource, which is limited. Um, and if this disease were to you know, ex explode with people not doing social distancing, with people not taking their public health officials seriously, um, then we may be in a situation where we need them to save lives and, and we don't have enough. So the critical care community is very interested, continuing to be very interested in figuring out ways that we can offer that technology to as many people as we possibly can if the situation ever should call for it. That said, we have learned an awful lot about how to take care of these patients quickly. And one of the things that we've learned is that if we can use other techniques to keep patients oxygenated and breathing comfortably without having to resort to medical, uh, to mechanical ventilation early in the course of their disease, their outcomes are probably a little better. Um, so does, pro does proning actually work? Oh, yes. I mean, the, the research is forthcoming, but I can see it. You know, we, we have the, uh, the patient right in front of us who's struggling and hypoxemic and we ask them to voluntarily prone their body and we just watch their sats go up. So um, you know, we have excellent evidence on that and other uh, forms of lung disease that are similar to this and we're developing that evidence in COVID, but it's, it's very helpful. And we're all asking almost all of our awake patients to voluntarily self prone when they're hypoxemic. And those who are intubated are all receiving proning based on a protocol if they're able to tolerate it. And it's very helpful. Thank you. I want to turn from the specific to the more general. And Dr. Arkush, here is a loaded question. <laughs> some of the counties, particularly some of the five great counties, Philadelphia and surrounding, have medical directors, commissioners of public health. Some of them don't. What is the impact of having one or not having one? And do you have an opinion about that, whether professional, personal, or combined? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the impact is, is substantial. And I hope, I, I have a long, what we call after action list that I started about day two of this. And one of the things at the top of that list is I hope that the public and legislators in Harrisburg and Washington finally understand the importance of public health funding. Um, we don't have to look any further than our dear neighbor, Delaware County, who started this with no health department and a pretty substantial population. So that meant several things. It meant that they were completely reliant on the Pennsylvania Department of Health for all of their data and interpretation of their data. 
they also had no flexibility to make any personal decisions within their county government. So for instance, from day one, from the first moment I announced our first two cases, people in Montgomery County knew which municipalities they lived in. You know, we have 62 municipalities. The county is about 48 miles at its longest. So it was very important that people understood how close or far they were from those initial cases. We also, very importantly, automatically and still do to this day, put the address of any positive individual into our 911 system. So that if a 911 call comes from that address, it just pops up on the screen and the telecommunicators alert the first responders they need to go with PPE on, that this is a, a address that's been identified as the home of someone who's tested positive. So things like that, you know, just very practical things, as well as just having the intellectual um, uh, bandwidth and, and, and um, education and training to analyze all this data that is like drinking out of a fire hydrant every single day. And so thankfully, a few weeks in, Chester County uh, created a, a memorandum of understanding with Delaware County. So Chester's been functioning as Delco's health department. But you know, we are starting to see, and I'm sure if, if you saw a, a recent Inquirer article, that Delaware County's caseload is actually a little higher, and per capita, higher than I think maybe any of us at this point, and actually starting to trend up a little bit. So I do think not having just all those basic public health pieces in place that you can quickly activate in an emergency like this really puts you at a disadvantage. Do you think there's a likelihood that somebody cynically or not might say in a year, okay, it happened. It happened before 1918. That's 102 years. We don't really have to worry. <laughs> I'm sure someone will say that. They'll probably be saying it right now or next week. But um, as you all know, there's a, that adage in public health that if it's working, nothing happens. And I said at the very beginning of this, I was actually interviewed for an article, and I said, if we do this right, people are going to look back and say that we overreacted because we don't have 2 million deaths. You know, we have hopefully a much, much, much lower number. And we don't re uh, realize those most dire projections. And so I think that's inevitable. And <clears throat> my hope is that um, groups, you know, physicians like all of us on this, uh, participating in this, but also organizations like College of Physicians can help amplify everyone's voice to the importance of some of these basic public health infrastructure needs in our communities. And I think we'll have a little time to um, strike that iron that, you know, it's gonna be hot for a while and that we can hopefully get some lasting and substantive change put into place because we all know there'll be another one. I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Endy. Um, you are well known for your teaching and interest in teaching. Do you think this pandemic will lead to a renaissance of bedside medicine and the physical exam? And I bring <laughs> that up because as some of our older colleagues talk about or joke about the quote unquote younger people aren't interested in talking to the patients or examining the patient. They just want to see lab results and studies. George, I'm very concerned. I really am very concerned that um, with the, as we move towards telemedicine and video visits, the uh, value of the physical exam, which please trust me, people, remains essential to medical diagnosis. The value of physical exam will get marginalized. The one thing you cannot do when you have a patient on the telephone or on Blue Jeans, Zoom, or you know, Microsoft Teams is to examine them. And that, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that we will be training a group of medical students. There will be uh, about a two year period, I believe, of students who will come through their training, unlike the um, five of us on this panel who were educated in the hospital with stethoscopes around our neck. There will be two years worth of students 
who will be educated by examining patients by video and by telephone. And that, um, I think, will threaten the importance of the physical examination. That will be one of the things that we educators must work extremely hard to restore once things begin to get back to normal. But right now, um, we're simply not examining people. Uh, we, we, we now, most of our patients are choosing to do video visits or telephone visits. And that does not give the physician the opportunity to put the stethoscope on the chest. So we have a real challenge ahead of us. So Dr. Andy, let me be difficult. I have seen clips in Israel of hospitals in a box being delivered to people's homes that have hookups for blood pressure cups and yep. stethoscopes, et cetera. And remote, truly remote physical exams are being done. Well, I think if the technology can somehow, you know, pull this one off, that would be wonderful. Um, I think the jury is still out about whether that kind of examination is the same as a carefully um, developed exam by an experienced clinician who knows where to apply the stethoscope, what position to put the patient in, you know, how to listen to the heart when they're inspiring and expiring. These are, these are challenging my um, skills. And I just don't, I'm just not sure that we'll replicate that electronically. Um, you, uh, this is a general that, question to the panel. Yes. Would some of you think there might be a class of visits that would lend themselves particularly well to telemedicine such that your patients wouldn't have to spend an hour, hour and a half coming, reading all the old New Yorkers, uh, <laughs> getting very frustrated for sitting there for two hours to be looked at for three minutes and said, the wound is doing fine or your whatever is all doing better. It might, that's a loaded question, of course. But is there a class of visits that might fall okay. well within the scope of telemedicine? I think, I'm going to come in very quickly and then ask my colleagues to amplify. The answer is absolutely yes. And I've spent my entire day on such visits. The diabetic in whom the critical information is what is their blood sugar. The hypertensive in whom the critical information is how is their blood pressure been doing. But these are all patients whom I know very well. I've listened to their hearts and lungs many, many times. Um, the patient who has new symptoms, I believe really does require a physical exam. And that's something that we're gonna to have to work hard to replace. Okay. Dr. Mammon, you were going to say? So I definitely, um, a colleague of mine, um, Judd Hollander might giggle if he hears this because he is, has definitely brought uh, telehealth technologies um, to Jefferson. And when he first started, I had my doubts. I, there is absolutely a place for telehealth. And, um, you know, I think I am not uh, a telehealth expert, but I know those who are very facile in it, there are mechanisms um, that are very innovative and interesting that become very collaborative with the patient in terms of their physical exam. So it's a whole other way of thinking of not sort of um, this unidirectional um, in exam and information, but a, a partnership of do this and does this hurt? And it's a little bit different, um, but it's a, it's a learned skill. That said, um, you know, as an emer there's data and there's sort of um, projections of what the hospital of the future will look like. And the hospital of the future, as has been modeled, is an ED, an ICU, and an OR, and everybody else not necessarily in-house, um, and everybody else having to figure out how to manage patients um, without these, these crutches that, we, that have been sort of the baseline of medicine. And I think we're at this point, right this second, of actually trying to see what is feasible and what is necessary. 
um, in terms of hospital level resources, in terms of outpatient clinic level resources. So I think, you know, one of, um, I mean, I'll just be blunt because that's sort of my MO, but one of the barriers to innovative changes in medicine is a very strong rooted anchoring in how it's always been. And I think in that, and I can speak as an emergency physician and as someone who has um, worked very hard to address the opioid crisis, one of the big things I think we're all pushed to answer is, is this system really meeting the needs of the patients? Um, and is it meeting in the needs of the patients in a way that they can? And right this second, we're dealing with the highest unemployment rate, which also equates for all physicians to the highest uninsured rate, right? Like we know that. So all systems are off right now. And it, it's really up to us to kind of think strong, innovatively, and meaningfully about what we do, about the services we provide, and about what we think our role is in a patient's health and wellness. And it's no longer, I mean, this, again, this is very much my perspective as an emergency physician, but the nine to five office hours is not working for the vast majority of people because no longer can you take two to three hours to go to the office, a doctor's office in the middle of the day. If you are a parent, if you are an hourly wage worker, that doesn't work. And so the other narrative that will, has been happening is what is appropriate ED utilization, emergency department utilization, and the idea that we're seeing people who should be seen in outpatient settings is true, but that's not because the patient is making wrong decisions necessarily. It's because the system is not set up to address a provide care the way they need it to be. And that may be out of business day hours and on weekends or nights or when they have a babysitter or something like that. So I just think um, there is an undeniable need and role for technology right now. There is also an undeniable need and role for all of us to take stock of what we do and how it is most useful to the people we serve. Um, the flip of technology is that it's not universally accessible. So, you know, all of the people who can see their primary care doctors over telehealth right now are not necessarily the people who have lost insurance and who don't have broadband Wi-Fi at home, right? So we're looking also at a setup for increased disparities across our system. So I want to, you've brought up several things that I want to come back to, but I'm, Dr. Feketa, as chair, of one of the largest and most important departments in the city. What do you see in your role as an educator for training the incoming crew, both med students and residence fellows for the next several years with respect to telemedicine? Well, I will answer that question in a We're moment. We're gonna have a three hour panel on that alone, by the way. I, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna take the prerogative to give you three positive aspects of what's going on. So first of all, our no-share rate at Temple was about 25%. It's dropped to about 3%. So those people are actually getting doctor care. It may not be what you normally expect. Number two, we're just learning how to use telehealth. It's new to us, and that's a struggle, and it always gets better as you get better at it, and that includes new technologies, but also new insights, and sometimes we just get better at uh, addressing our patients' concerns when we're more used to seeing them in this more natural environment of home. I know the psychiatrists are very happy to do telehealth visits because it avoids having people who are struggling to get around to have to take buses and trains to get to the office and then wait and then go home again. And the final thing I'll say, this is a little controversial before I get to your question, Dr. Walreich, is that I'm getting better at looking at records because a lot of what I do in the patients who I can't go to see is spend more time actually diving into their records, finding information that I just didn't have time for it before. I was walking from place to place, trying to get everything going with the gowns and so on. But for those patients I'm doing these sort of virtual visits, I am looking at old records. I'm looking at old images. I'm trying to figure out what really happened. Is that really an allergy that I'm talking about or is that just something that's being carried over? So those are three areas I think we have some opportunities to improve and hopefully get better outcomes because we have tools we learn to use better. Uh, you asked a question about medical education near and dear to my heart. 
and I worry about it because right now our residents are struggling a little bit because they have to do so many different things under very unusual circumstances. They don't have role models to, to, to follow in terms of people who've done this before, although I think they're very receptive and learning a ton, absolute ton about medicine in this very strange and weird way. So that I'm not so worried about. The students who are not quite as far along in their journey haven't been allowed to be part of the team as much as they need to be. We're trying to figure out how to bring them back and it's a tension between their safety, the limited amount of PPE that we have to protect our, all of our workers and um, the sort of efficiency of the system to have students integrated into a system that's already working very hard to maintain its efficiency. So I am very concerned, but I'm also optimistic that once we do get them back, once they come in, we will keep them safe. We will get them to see sick people. We'll get them to learn physical exam skills, as for Dr. Endy. And I think they'll learn it in a way that now has an appreciation for how important medicine is. And frankly, I think a lot of the time you can say, ah, medicine, not so important most of the time, but everyone's at risk. Everyone's concerned. We have their attention. Let's get our students back into the hospital and back into the clinic. Thank you. I'm gonna shift bases here now completely. Before, of course, she didn't know she was doing this, Dr. Arkush talked about PPE. We all know that a significant number of healthcare workers have gotten sick and have died from this disease. How have each of you handled this personally as far as going home or not going home and with your families? And obviously feel free to be as you know, personal and self-revelatory as you wish or not wish. Okay, Dr. Arkush, I'm gonna start with you. Well, in my current position, I'm not doing any direct patient care, but I will tell you that this issue of PPE has been an extraordinarily difficult one. So at the county level, we are directly responsible for ensuring and helping all of our first responder units, police, fire, and EMS. Uh, with their PPE needs. And so if they have an unmet need, they come to the county. We were somewhat prepared for that, but what we were not prepared for was when the hospitals began to run short, which didn't take very long, which I don't have to tell any of you, and half the uh, Hospital and Health Association of Pennsylvania, who the hospitals would typically uh, take their unmet needs to, turn to the county and, um, was hoping that somehow we had, you know, hidden piles of PPE somewhere. And then the next shoe to drop was our long-term care facilities. And uh, one of the early things that we started to see, and actually I'm gonna tie this back into the last discussion about telemedicine, and, and this is just a really a learning thing I've had, is that it was increased numbers of calls to 911 for hospital transports that were some of the first signs of brewing uh, extremely serious and dire situations in some of our long-term care facilities. And one of the things that um, we learned when we started to follow up, because certain facilities had made so many calls, that they didn't have enough PPE. And I think that you know there's places in this discussion for building new models that might include community paramedicine type models where paramedics were connected to physicians at the other end. Uh, students could go out and actually understand a little bit more about some social determinants of health as they see where people live. I think there's some really interesting and innovative things that we could bring out of this. But this struggle for PPE has been all consuming. And when we finally started to get a handle on the masks, uh, then the gowns, gone. <laughs> so nationwide shortage of gowns. And so I think what we all learned here was that nobody has enough stores of PPE. And I think that physician practices, particularly in private practice, where there's really nobody to help them, you know, everybody should think about having at least 10 days, two weeks of PPE stores in their offices, no matter how or where they practice. Because when something like this happens, it happens so fast and the supplies were gone so quickly, uh, particularly when we learned that the national stockpile was really not gonna be of a whole lot of use. So it has been really, really challenging. Dr. Mammon, you wrote an op-ed about the challenges of going home or not going home. I did. 
Um, so that the what I the article I wrote was actually um, kind of just an output of this um, oscillating discussion I was having in my own head <laughs> of um, feeling guilty for being so thankful that I could actually leave my house <laughs> and still um, contribute. And you know, I would watch and if if there's there's so many lessons out of this and like uh number two for me is how critical and important and amazing our teachers are because i cannot teach my children and there's only two so <laughs> um the ability to leave my house to do use my skill set and to do my work um actually became a lifeline for me and um you know, even just watching my husband, he has certainly been in the midst of an existential crisis of what he's doing and how he's helping and what his purpose is. And I, I would say a lot of people are having those same things of, you know, I just feel so powerless and hopeless. But the flip side is, I would see um, pictures, or I would, I would see the kind of PPE that was happening in some of the bigger academic centers, and I would not and we did not have that and i recognize that these are the things that you know i've never trained i've so i'm temple made so i know you know i was taught and trained to use very be judicious and appropriate resource utilization um but i have never in my lifetime questioned whether everything i would need um, was somewhere like somebody else took care of that and whether it was the hospital or the government I never questioned those things and that was the first time that I and this has been the first time that I've questioned I always just thought our government would come to the rescue and had the abilities and you know we're the United States of America and I started my career in international work and I've I've lived abroad and to me it was like we always had the top of everything at like a moment's notice and certainly that happens generally in the emergency department but i made the decision to isolate from my family because i couldn't really say for sure um and here's where you know like no real clear data um it became like a gut reaction and um my husband is from Italy and has experienced this in a whole other way with some family in Milan and some the rest in Tuscany and some getting very, very sick. And, you know, he just, this has unfolded in a different way. So I, I made the decision to isolate for my family in my own home though. I would, I would come in and just everybody would scatter and I, I would go to my bedroom and stay there. Um, I broke isolation after three weeks on mother's day um because the numbers went down but you know it and the question is same question of did i really need to do it because nobody got sick but if i didn't do it i i just couldn't having young children and having a husband and i'm not wanting anyone to get sick because of the kind of work i do and because of the scenarios and situations i was in and you know the flip is i also work in kensington which is not um protected and certainly exceptionally high risk people so i made the decision nobody got sick i'm out of i'm out of uh iso <laughs> i'm much better mentally than i was it's amazing how all those little annoying things your children and husband do then become like oh my god i need to hear that whining <laughs> otherwise i'm gonna lose my mind <laughs> dr feketa how about you and your personal journey with this you know, I don't have children at home, so I don't have that concern. And I think in the very beginning, I felt uh, as a person of a certain age that there might be some personal risk. And I don't normally feel that way. And I, I normally just shake it off. But it would come back to me once in a while, just seeing very, very otherwise well people coming in and becoming very, very ill. But I feel more confident now. I think that our understanding of the disease has improved. I don't feel as personally at risk. I do worry about my neighbors. I have a lot of older folks, even older than me, believe it or not, here in the building, and they don't seem to necessarily understand the distancing issues and wear masks all the time. So I worry for them. But for myself personally, no, I, I feel like what's going to happen is going to happen, and I hope that I have the constitution to weather it. But I do want to look out for people. I want to make sure that they're doing as best they can, which is really challenging. And as Dr. Mammon said, it's it's sometimes 
weird not to have these sort of social touch things happening in your head. It's uh, you don't notice it on a given moment, and then all of a sudden the absence of it is startling. A little bit like there were no planes in the air after 9/11, and you really noticed that, not because you were paying attention to them before, but you noticed that it wasn't happening. And sometimes things not happening um, is sneakier and deeper than things that are happening. Dr. Nareski, how about your personal experience? Do you care to share it? I didn't know that um, Dr. Manon had had the opportunity to publish about her experience because I did the same thing about my choice about whether I was going to be staying home uh, with my family or whether I was going to be isolating. Um, so I really got a lot out of that too. You know, having the opportunity to talk about it uh, publicly actually was really heartening for me. Um, in my situation, I have a husband who has a uh, deeply severe uh, autoimmune disease. And for that reason, he's on uh, significant immune suppression medications, which he can't stop. And yet he lives with and sleeps right next to a person who today went to work and uh, worked in an ICU room where there were three patients with COVID coming out their ears, all of whom were on non-invasive ventilation with the gases just blowing. and. Um, we had to make a choice about how we were going to handle that. Um, in our situation, uh, the choice has been made easier a little perversely because um, I became quite ill and so did my husband um, about five weeks ago when this was really starting to be something I was seeing every day in intensive care. Um, and I had a four week long, pretty serious illness and I received the you know, the testing and everything, my test was negative, but as we know, depending on the phase of illness in which you get tested, that's not necessarily a, a sign that I didn't have it, um, but I did really have all the symptoms. So I went through a 14 day quarantine and was monitored and I'm still monitored by our wonderful occupational health department. So um, because my husband and I became sick right around the same time, um, we are hoping that we both have antibodies and have decided from this point forward not to isolate from one another. Um, however, we co-parent children um, and their mother has uh, made the decision to keep them with her because of what I do. And so it has been uh, quite a significant loss for us to not have been able to physically see or touch or <laughs> be near or be in the same room with the children since uh, late February, so. That must be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Dr. Endy, you, are you comfortable sharing some of your experiences? My experiences, George, have been- Dr. Endy, could you get a little closer to your microphone, please? Yes, sir. My experiences have been secondhand. Um, I will be going in to see patients physically later this week, but thus far, I've not been in the hospital. I've been working from home, doing a lot of video visits and, and telephone visits but I've been absolutely glued to the emails from my younger colleagues. Um, I've, I've not been doing any inpatient attending. My, I was not on, I was not supposed to based upon the schedule. And had I even been uh, on that schedule, given my age, which is even greater than Dr. Feketa, believe it or not, uh, I would have probably <laughs> been, uh, asked not to do that. So I, um, I lived through this with, through my younger colleagues. And just as Dr. Maman and Dr. Naruski have come, what we've seen is one colleague, colleague sharing experiences, reading about colleagues who decided to stay in hotels rather than go home. Colleagues who would go home and change their shoes and clothes in the garage and you know, develop these rituals where they would run upstairs and go right to the shower to avoid uh, contaminating anything in there. This was absolutely amazing. This was inspirational. Um, and I just stand in awe of what my younger colleagues have gone through. Thank you. I'm gonna switch again. And Dr. Arkush, you mentioned something in passing that as you may have, all of you may have seen has uh, fascinated me. I think most people, depending on who's watching this, are not aware of that two major thresholds 
were passed in medicine in the last decade. One is that for the first time, there are more women than men in medical school. <laughs> and the second one is for the first time ever, there are more employed physicians than self-employed. And I'm not going to do an age competition with Dr. Endy, but I remember growing up, I didn't know any doctors who weren't running what were in effect mom and pop medical practices. Now we didn't call them that because we didn't think of them that way, but they were self-employed physicians. And that model has shifted radically. However, if your parents ever said to you, go into medicine, it's economically bomb-proof, COVID-19 has proven that is not true. And there are systems now that are letting thousands of healthcare workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians aid, physicians, et cetera, either furloughed or just laid off. What, ha what has that been like for all of you to see this and to see, oh, it may not be the corner pizzeria, but it's still in the same economic universe. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Naroski here. As critical care providers, more than, well, alongside the other members of the healthcare team, we rely on the hard work that primary care doctors out in the community are giving to our patients to help prevent them from needing to come through our door and from overwhelming us. Um, I'm very concerned about the impact of the loss of providers in the community on patients, their long-term health, and also on the impacts that that could have for what our healthcare system will need to be able to provide them down the road. Fortunately, I'm unaffected. My, my job as a critical care provider is in fact bomb-proof, so I can't speak <laughs> to that personally. Dr. Feketa? I have to say, I'm very proud that Temple's been able to retain all the physicians and not have to cut back or cut salaries. And they've made uh, a lot of uh, interesting decisions that I think have been fairly well received with the other members of the healthcare team to either keep them fully occupied or to let them go out onto um, unemployment, which is not uh, a terrible benefit at the present time with the idea that we'll be relatively brief and we'll have everyone come back. But, you know, I gotta say, the healthcare system has done an amazing job absorbing what is unprecedented change. And I think without a lot of complaint. And I think if you look around our society, people who are hit with what we've been hit with in terms of the risk to the various people who work there, in terms of the economic uncertainty, in terms of the frustration about having the appropriate medications, personal equipment, laboratory tests and so on, I, I'm very, very heartened that our system is robust, that we can, as human beings, um, make the best of what is a very challenging situation. So it gives me a lot of um, happiness to know that we have this structure that is very strong in spite of all the challenges and all the naysayers and the people who are worried about everything all the time. So uh, it's been tough and I think some of our systems will not make it, but I think a lot of them will tough it out because that's what we do. Dr. Maimon? Um, this is an interesting, it's an interesting and sort of loaded question, but. Of course. Um, I will say, I, I mean, sort of echoing something that Dr. Feketa said much earlier in the conversation, I don't think, so I'm always very proud and very honored um, to be an emergency physician, but I am so, so always like the biggest cheerleader for the entire team that works in the ED. And I think um, the ICU is similar where it is very much a team and we work together. We can't do everything that everybody does as a single entity. And so we're sort of this united front. Um, and we have at every step of every crisis that, that has come across our our city, our country, emergency departments are always right there and emergency physicians are there. That's just how we're sort of built and we think. So through this, I've just, you know, like been even more elated and so proud of 
my colleagues, and that's, that's outside of the ED, that's all of us, because it's true, every single one of us has stepped up. And there was, you know, there's concerns and fears, but there was never complaining, and there was never um, any question of uh, fairness or any of it. It's just, this is what we do. This is what we're trained to do. This is what we go into medicine to do. Uh, we have a skill set that nobody has. Um, and we are always happy to put that skill set into action. The flip though, I'll be, you know, I was um, in isolation when the Blue Angels and the fighter jets <laughs> flew over Philly. Um, but I, so like we have a little porch and so I was on the third floor looking at the porch at the, at the plains and I see all the kids down below I live in the city, so there's, you know, everybody was gathered, <laughs> despite my being like separate, like spread out kids, <laughs> stop screaming and spitting on each other. Um, and the very next day, um, where I work, there was an email that furloughs were going to come out, uh, that were going to be um, put in place and some layoffs without any clear idea of who that was going to touch. So it was just, it was this kind of double-edged sword of for so many weeks, we had nationally had this narrative of how how healthcare providers were heroes. And we still have that narrative of like, they're heroes, they're our heroes. We're lighting up buildings blue, we're sending out the fighter pilots to show them. Um, but the reality, it comes down to money, you know, and it comes down to, we are still seen as, um, a group with a skill set that may be, um, you know, deemed not not as, as essential as the national narrative is, or you know, um, you know, can be sort of swept aside. And that is not new. It's just that now it's really obvious. Um, and I think for those of us who I am currently um, sort of self-employed, I am I. Um, um, I work for myself, but I, I obviously, as an emergency physician, work in other hospitals. But for those of us who have been salaried or not, you know, very much a lot of maneuverability happens based on overall financial well-being. Um, and a lot of decisions about what will be supported and what isn't comes down to financial decisions. So if you're me and my entire sort of mission is um, decreasing disparity and working directly with those who have been um, underrepresented or sort of excluded from the way our health system works. There's not a lot of money in that. And, you know, this, there's a lot more money in surgery. So here's where it comes, like, we're all sort of becoming potential victims of other parts of the health system in this case, in a lot of cases, I think elective surgeries and those kinds of ways the system holds itself up, but we're still needed. So it becomes, you know, it, it's a very difficult position to be in um, to kind of understand what it means for the future. And here's where, you know, like looking at all of the people coming behind us, whether that be medical students or in, in my case, I have undergrad students. I don't, I have no sense of what this means. I don't know what, you know, what it means for the next five years if we're very clearly in the state of high need of who we are and what we do, um, still finding a way to kind of say, well, we can't really afford you, so we're just gonna do that and see what happens. Thank you. And but Dr. Yeah, yeah, I would love to add just kind of a um, maybe underappreciated perspective in this. So my, much of my role throughout this, in addition to just keeping our county running and, and doing all the other things that we need to do to, to make sure as many people as possible are safe, I've been the lead spokesperson for our county with the public, and I do a press briefing pretty much five days a week. And when the first layoff, hospital layoffs were announced in our region, and we did have a hospital and um, some other smaller entities that were laying off physicians, the, what the public heard or how, or how the public interpreted that was, oh, everything must be okay. The hospitals have so few patients that now they're laying people off. 
And so we must have flattened the curve and this must be over. And so we should be relaxing the restrictions, letting businesses open up, and I'm just gonna go out to my merry way to my local big box store and crowd the garden center at that store with a hundred other people and buy flowers. And then and come was, meet me. Yeah, it, I mean, it was catastrophe. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that um, this has done a couple of things. You know, it's, it's laid bare the inadequate financing system for our hospitals that their entire margin is based on elective surgeries. And yet in this moment of crisis for our country where people like Dr. Mammon and Dr. Nareski who are highly skilled professionals are absolutely critical to this, nobody knows how to pay for that. And in fact, we never pay for that, enough for that. Meanwhile, on the flip side, the public hears, oh, they're laying off hospital workers crisis must be over. That has to mean we have enough beds. And so it really set up an incredibly difficult situation. And I will tell you, at least in Montgomery County, that was the beginning of the unraveling of the social cohesion that we had worked so hard to create to encourage everyone to uh, maintain this social distancing because it just sent the wrong message. So the fallout from this, I mean, obviously, you know, critical for those individuals that were furloughed or laid off, but there was a whole ripple effect through the community that that message sent when that started. Thank you. And if we were going to go for another hour or have another panel, as you've been so doing so wonderfully tonight, I would bring up as a totally separate topic, financing of safety net hospitals and what happens. However, I want to turn and end with the last question for all of you. And as the third loaded question of this tonight, it's both a professional question, but a personal question. And let me lay, lay the background of the question. Two days ago, my wife and I went out for a very brief walk down a sm small side street in Center City, Philadelphia. There were about 10 people in the entire walk back and forth. Half of them had no masks on and half of them were within a foot of each other at all times with, the, with no masks. The weather is beautiful. The mayor says, don't go down the shore, but if you do go down the shore, don't be a jerk. What do you tell people who see television, see these people, describe them any way you want, from Yahoo to freedom loving. What do you say to your patients? What do you say to your families? And what do you say to yourselves about going out in this beautiful weather on a Memorial Day weekend coming up? Dr. Andy, I'm gonna start with you again. I think we all have have to stand tall, we have to stand tough, uh, we have to be wearing masks, we have to continue social distancing. Um, this is not going away immediately. And what a shame it would be if we would relax and only to see after a couple of weeks, still a second surge until we have vaccines and the vaccines, then we will have to be smart. Dr. Norovsky? I would say that even if you're a young person and you feel comfortable that this wouldn't be something that you would be affected by, even if you're a person who doesn't get too worried about themselves, we, you have to worry about your loved ones. You have to worry about your family. You have to worry about your fellow man. Wearing a mask is something that we do for ourselves, but we do it mostly for other people. So please be compassionate to those around you uh, and consider wearing a mask and maintaining your social distancing. There's not such a thing as a society where we can protect the vulnerable and everybody else will be separate from them and we don't have to worry about those people. Uh, never shall the twain meet. That doesn't exist. Every person who gets infected is a risk to every other person in the society. So we need to keep working hard to keep ourselves safe. 
And if you think that, oh, maybe this is only a disease of the elderly, or maybe it's only a disease of the immunocompromised, I invite you to come and spend an afternoon with me and meet some of these people who are affected and who are 30-year-old Uber drivers and 42-year-old accountants and just people. They're people. They're you and me and our loved ones. And they're desperately sick. Um, and just because it's not something you can see doesn't mean it's not exist that it's not there, that it's not serious. So, um, you know, please follow the advice of the wonderful public health officials that we're so lucky to have with us today. Um, because we, we just can't, we just can't afford to not. I, I thought that was truly interesting that Mayor Kenny used such a highly technical medical expression where he said, don't be a jerk, you know, <laughs> during his press conference. Yes. Dr. Fekita, your comments, please. I agree with everything that's been said, but I also have to say that I do understand why people struggle. And I know that there's a lot of mental health issues that are triggered by the changes we've gone through lately, that there is a kind of um, tribal behavior that people sometimes engage in when they're anxious and sometimes they don't behave very well, whether it's because of um, the anxiety or uh, alcohol or some other things. And so I try to be very non-judgmental. I, I understand why it's hard for people. I understand why people struggle around a lot of things. I do encourage people to do the right thing, to separate from each other, to wear a mask, to go out when necessary and try to be as uh, judicious as they can be. But I do recognize it's hard. And I think that uh, it doesn't help matters to be mean or, or to be dismissive because sometimes it looks arrogant and it looks um, fairly classist, you know, people are judging people who are different from them. Having said that, I totally support the idea that we should encourage by example and by the most gentle kinds of persuasion people to behave as best they know how. Thank you. Dr. Mammon. Um, so I completely agree. I, I think everybody should continue to wear masks and continue to be socially distant um, and really keep as much of the um, systems and practices we've had in place um, continue to be in place. But uh, I agree also with Dr. Fekita. I think so much um, of this comes to messaging. You know, people just want someone to be clear and trustworthy and say, I'm, this is what you need to do and this is why. And I think there's so much, you know, from our non-medical leaders of you have to take in all of the different um, people you're talking to. So you have to make sure the business owners are not going into full on panic. You have to make sure that you're not painting this um, dire picture, um, but you have to be very strong. Um, and I think that's the sort of nuances of that. I think, I mean, even in medicine, right? Like we're all medical educators and we have been taught and teach our students to not be paternalistic. Like that's just not the way American medicine is practiced to be preachy and say, absolutely do this because that doesn't take in to account the whole patient. And yet here we are saying, wear a mask no matter what, <laughs> and stay distant no matter what. And it feels weird even to us, you know? Um, I mean, my children say, I, I mean, they say this for various reasons, but they say, I'm the meanest mom because I'm the only one who makes them like, re I'm super hardcore on them playing with friends who, and not, and just getting too close because those friends also have parents who are physicians and or there's any number of ways that we can spread unknowingly. And I think, um, you know, a key, I think I do believe that those of us who live in the city, this perhaps comes a little bit more naturally um, than those of us who don't live in the city, but we're individuals amongst a group and we're only as strong as the group is. And so, the people who sort of understand um, this is a sacrifice and this is terrible as the weather gets nicer um, to have to still think and do all these things and not do all the things that we're used to doing as springtime blooms. Um, we're doing it so that we don't have to do it forever and we don't have to do it um, as stringently as we have. It's but, you know, to Dr. Arkush, 
the it's also surreal right it's this virtual thing of numbers lives saved illnesses averted that becomes hard after this much time and i think had we from the beginning said we don't know as opposed to this is going to be two weeks <laughs> and this two weeks turned into none of our children going back to school turned into not knowing really what tomorrow is going to look like but no different than today and no idea when it's going to really change you know we did um ourselves a disservice but we inadvertently undermined um our community just by not being forthcoming Thank you. And Dr. Arkush, please. Well, this is the question I get literally every day. And what I try to remind people is that we've only known about this virus since about January and that we learn new things about it practically on a daily basis. And one of the things that's become so abundantly clear is that there are many, I believe many, many of um, our fellow citizens that are COVID positive, but they had no symptoms, and so they have had no reason to get tested. And they are walking around with the virus, they are contagious, and they are completely asymptomatic. And so I encourage people to think that maybe that's them. And just out of respect for the people they encounter when they are out and about, they wear a mask. Uh, to follow all the social distancing guidelines in stores, to take their business to stores that are practicing social distancing within those stores and, and try to help everyone think about this as an effort for our entire community. Because you don't know who you're standing next to in the grocery store line. It could be somebody fighting cancer. It could be somebody with diabetes or who's otherwise immunocompromised. And you can't tell that from looking at them. But you are respecting them by wearing a mask just in case you happen to be one of those people that has the virus and is contagious, but doesn't have symptoms. And just appealing to everyone's goodwill as a member of this community. Um, I get very discouraged when I hear, and I, you know, I see a lot of this directed at me in social media, that you know, freedom means the freedom to infect other people. I hope that that is very much a minority opinion in our country and in our communities here. This is one time where we must band together. We all want this to end. And the quickest way for us uh, to all help it end is to be part of the solution, not part of additional spread. So we'll see, you know, it's in people's hands at this point. Um, I hope that people can hang in there a little bit longer in our region. So we will get through this as quickly and as su successfully as possible. So I wanna, in wrapping this up, and I'm gonna ask all of you to stay on once we stop the recording, but I want to thank Dr. Jack Endy, Dr. Priya Mammon, Dr. Thomas Feketa, the, the Honorable Dr. Valerie Arkush, and Dr. Erin Naruski for their contributions this afternoon on behalf of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. And this is Dr. George Walreich saying, stay well, stay socially apart, but spiritually close. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.